Good morning, church. It's so great to be with you today. Just a couple things to let you know about before we get into the message. First of all, at the end of today's video, we will be uh, participating in communion together. So you can pause now or maybe later and just make sure to collect the elements of communion uh, before we get to the end. And that way we can do that together. Uh, also, speaking of sacraments of the church, we are going to be opening up the water baptism tank on October the 9th. That is Thanksgiving Sunday. So if you have not been baptized since you first believed, or if you have questions about baptism, you want to know more about it, get in touch with myself, Pastor Danny Jones, or any of the church office staff, and we'd love to uh, talk you through following Jesus in this amazing step of obedience. Uh, as you heard about last week, we have a lot of new life groups on the go, as well as many of our older ones, <clears throat> and they've all sort of started up for this fall and are running uh, right now. We'd love for you to be involved in one. If you're not involved in a life group, getting connected to one of these midweek uh, ministries is a great way to just really um, walk after Jesus, to learn things that maybe we won't necessarily get to on a Sunday morning, but that in community you can ask questions, you can learn, you can develop new friendships. There's just so much to being in a life group. So we have a wide variety right now, different age ranges, different demographics, different meeting times, dates, all of that. Go to our website, find one that works for you, uh, get connected to a life group today. And lastly, there's a reminder today that we are going to be looking forward to Trunk or Treat at the end of October. We're so excited to be bringing back uh, this event as we had to take a break during the pandemic. And when we brought it back last October, it was bursting at the seams. We're expecting even more people this year. So get ready for Trunk or Treat. Mark your calendars. It'll be Monday, October the 31st. And we're going to start it at 6 o'clock, and it goes until 7.30. Next week, you're going to be hearing more about how you can get involved with volunteering or hosting a trunk. Uh, but that information comes later. For now, just mark your calendars. Get ready. Trunk or Treat is going to be awesome. So, with all that said, I hope you're ready. I hope you're excited. Church starts now. So, today we come to what is very realistically my favorite passage in the entire Bible. Now, I know that I'm guilty of saying that a lot whenever I'm up here preaching uh, whatever passage I happen to be going through, I often say, oh, I love this one. It's one of my favorites. And that's true, by the way. Like, I'm not just saying that. I really do have a lot of favorite parts of Scripture because there's a lot of parts of Scripture to love. But I want you to know it wasn't always like that for me. I, I did go through sort of a journey of learning to fall in love with Scripture. And although I tend to be pretty hyperbolic and exaggerated in my speech, I know that. Uh, I truly do today love Scripture, and I love the Bible and the Word of God. When I was first really dipping my toe into uh, Christianity in general as a young teenager, I didn't get the Bible. And not just that I didn't understand it when I read it, I didn't get the concept of it. I'd hear these Christians talk about reading their Bible year after year after year, and I was just sitting there thinking, like, are they ever going to finish it? Like, how slow are they at reading? Or how long is this book that it takes years to finish? And then I found out that they do finish it, and they just read the whole thing over again. And I thought, man, there are some books that I absolutely love, but that I, I can't read every single year. And when I was first starting to read the Bible, it really was from a place of understanding that, you know, this is what's right, this is what I should do, so I'm going to do it. But I didn't love it at first. And my journey of learning to fall in love with Scripture has been one that has taken all the way up to today, and, and I'm still learning. If I'm being candid, I don't like all of the Bible the same way. Probably I should, because it's all the Word of God, and it's all good. But there are parts that, to me today, still feel like a little bit more disconnected, or they feel like a slog to read through, or I don't understand them as much, or they're not my genre, because the Bible is made up of many different genres. But the passage that we're going to be reading today out of Philippians chapter 2, this is, for me, a crown jewel of Scripture. And the book of Philippians is the first one that I read as a teenager where I finally felt like, oh, this is written for me. God wrote this for me. He's communicating to me. And since then, I've found that in many more places in the pages of the Bible. But the book of Philippians was the first. 
Now, this book is written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi, which was a city in Europe at that time. And there was a church there that was doing quite well. They were fairly wealthy, comparatively speaking, and yet they didn't allow their wealth to corrupt them. In fact, they were insanely generous, as we're going to hear more about in chapters 3 and 4. They were doing really well spiritually. They were growing and developing. And this was contrasted with Paul's letters to many of the other churches that he wrote to in the New Testament where he was having to write a letter of correction and saying like, hey, you're not doing this right. You need to shore this up. You need to you know, work on this. But when he was writing to the Philippians, he's saying like, congratulations, you're doing great. I'm encouraging you. I'm rejoicing with you. This is often called the epistle of joy, the letter of joy. And I really started to resonate from a young age with this letter specifically and with this passage in this letter. <clears throat> now today we're going to read verses 1 to 18, Philippians 2, 1 to 18. And right away, as you open your Bibles there, you'll notice that this starts with a therefore. And if you've spent any length of time with Pastor Tom, you know that when you're reading the Bible and you see a therefore, you have to know what it's there for because it's a transitionary word. It's bringing us from one thing to another. So last week, Pastor Danny Jones preached on Philippians chapter one, and he touched on the idea of unity and the idea of living a life worthy of the gospel. That's what Paul speaks about in chapter one, living a life worthy of the gospel. And so the therefore here transitions us into chapter two. It's saying, because you have been called to live a life worthy of the gospel, you must now do these things that we're going to talk about in chapter 2. Therefore, chapter 2. So let's open our Bibles. <clears throat> let's read this together. We're going to take our time. We're going to chew on it. There's so much in this. I want you to just really hear these words that Paul's not just writing to the church at Philippi, but he's also writing to all Christians through all time. This is what it says. Paul writes, therefore, <clears throat> if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on that day, on the day of Christ, that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering, on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, 
I am glad and rejoice with you all. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Such an amazing and beautiful passage of scripture. And it answers that question from chapter one. How do we live a life worthy of the gospel, worthy of the good news of Jesus Christ? There's three things here that we're going to see today, three sections to this. First, we see that there's unity required. As we talked about last week, we're going to talk about it again this week. Then we see that there's humility required. And then finally, we see that we have to work out our faith. We have to work it out with self-discipline. Now, I'm going to save that one for last uh, because I know that already the idea of working hard is causing some people to squirm in their seats. So I'm just going to let you sit with that for a bit, but we will get there too. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it is good, good, good. Thank you that you encourage us, you build us up as we open these pages. Lord, I pray that as we go through this, that you would communicate something new, something fresh about who you are, who we are, and how we are to walk. Would you meet us in these pages? In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, the first thing on the list to talk about is unity. Right off the top, Paul is talking about being unified. Verses 1 and 2 talk about this a lot, and there's, there's a parallelism here. In verse 1, Paul uses a lot of if statements. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love. Well, of course, these are rhetorical statements. Paul is writing rhetorically because we know that there is comfort in his love and that there is encouragement from being united with him. So although Paul says if, just as a a literary device, we could really swap that out for because. Change all the ifs to because, and, and we know that those things are true and that they are good. So really, verse one could be read as, Because you have encouragement from being united with Christ, because you have comfort from his love, because you have common sharing in the Holy Spirit, and because of tenderness and compassion, then we are called to do the things in verse 2. He says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind, or better translated as one in purpose, one in will and desire. All of these things reflect one another. Because we have encouragement from being united with Christ, then we can be like-minded. Because we have comfort from his love, we can then be called to have the same love. The same love that brings us comfort and encouragement is the love that we're called to have for our brothers and sisters and those around us. Because we have common sharing in the Spirit, we should be of one Spirit. We should invite the Holy Spirit in to our fellowship, to our togetherness, to our community and our relationship. And because we have tenderness and compassion, that kindness and gentleness and love born of the things of God, because we have that, we can be of one purpose. And that purpose is the love of God. And so our unity here is built on these parallel concepts. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we should be unified. He begins by saying in verse 2, make my joy complete by being like-minded. I love the phrase he uses here. First of all, when he says make my joy complete, Paul is writing to this church as a father figure, someone who helped plant and grow them. He really cares about them. He's saying nothing would make my joy more filled, more full. Nothing would make me happier than to see you living in unity and love with one another. Paul has a deep care for those he's writing to. And then he says to be like-minded. And the question is, well, what mind is that? What mind should we have in common? And the answer is that we need to have the mind set on Christ. The mind set on Christ is above and beyond the mindset on anything earthly, the mindset on the flesh, the mindset on the cares of this world. When we collectively choose to set our thoughts, our wills, our purposes on Jesus, we create unity. Because even though we may disagree in a worldly sense, we will be agreed in a cosmic sense. And we will disagree. We will disagree in a worldly sense. I mean, Even in the church, there's going to be disagreement. I think we all know that. But I want to tell you, it's okay. God made us all different. 
We're allowed to disagree in politics and the economy and food and clothing and music and what movie's the best. That's part of us being unique creations. But when we have the mind set on Christ, when we truly understand that Jesus is surpassing, superior, better, amazing, above everything in this world, all of those other things fade into the background. They don't go away. Those disagreements don't disappear. But those disagreements begin to bow at the feet of the God of love who unifies us above everything else in this world. When we choose to set our mind on Christ, our disagreements look less like war and more like sport. In an earthly sense, disagreements often are like war. There's conflict, there's confrontation, there's two sides. And blood will be drawn, injury will happen, maybe even casualties and death. If not as the goal, certainly as a byproduct. But when we choose to set our minds on Christ, then our disagreements become more like sport. Not that they are necessarily fun, that's not what I'm saying. But that there will still be conflict, there will still be confrontation. In sport, there's still two sides that are opposing, and yet injury and damage is not the goal. There's still a respect. There's still sportsmanship. And at the end of the disagreement, we can still shake hands and recognize that while we may have been on opposite sides for this issue, we're all on the same field. That field is the mind set on Christ. And may every disagreement bow first and foremost to him and his lordship. Paul goes on to warn us. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Paul is identifying that there is no greater threat to unity than selfishness. There is no greater threat to unity than selfishness. And selfish ambition is that seeking to puff ourselves up, seeking after personal power, greed, money, uh, anything like that, prestige, that selfish ambition, and vain conceit. I love the word in Greek here. It's one word used for vain conceit. And the word, it, it actually translates as empty glory. But the language used is, is very poetic. It's got an imagery to it. it. It's the image of a not light, a light that illuminates nothing. When we seek to puff ourselves up, we're trying our best to shine, and all we have done is given off nothing. Paul is warning us away from that. Get rid of selfish ambition. Get rid of vain conceit. Instead, look to the needs of others. Love the church. Love your community. Live in unity with one another. Then you will truly shine. The road to unity is, is fraught with side passages. And if we go to pride, we're going to end up in discord, not unity. If we allow selfish ambition to reign in our lives, then we will not end at the mindset on Christ. We will end at the mindset on ourselves. If we want to get to unity, the true path leads through humility. And that's our next section here in the text. Humility as shown by Jesus. Paul says, in your relationships with one another... Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That word that's used there to mean same mindset is the same word in verse 2 that says like-minded. The mindset on Christ, but not just set on Christ. I'm not just supposed to think about Jesus. I'm called to think like Jesus. To have his mindset be my mindset. My thoughts shouldn't just rest on him. My thoughts should reflect him. My thought life submitted to his lordship. Jesus is the supreme example of humility and selfless service of others. And if Jesus, being fully God, if Jesus, the God of the universe, can humble himself, can lay down his rights in the service of us, how much more are we called to do the same? Now, this section is, you may see in your Bible, broken up like a poem because it, it just represents such a, a high level of Christology. That is to say, this is a perfect representation for us, a, a view into who Jesus is, that he is the blending of God and man, fully God, 100% deity, and yet fully man, 100% human. 
No different than you and me except for his sinlessness. He had the full human experience. And this passage really illuminates that. It says that Jesus, being in very nature God, that is to say, being 100% God, he has the same essence as God. And yet, just a few lines later, it says that he took the very nature, the essence of a servant. The section in the middle, where in the NIV, which is what I'm reading from, it says that he made himself nothing. But other translations say that he emptied himself. The language and the idea is that Jesus has divested himself of that which he is owed, that which he had the right to claim as the king and God of the universe. He laid all of those things down, emptied himself of those things in order to serve us, in order to be obedient, even to the point of dying for us on the cross. Jesus' humility, coming down from the heights of heaven to that manger on Christmas, to that cross on Easter, that is our model for humility. The way that Jesus laid aside his pride and his rights is our cue to do the same, to lay aside our pride, to lay aside our rights, and to be obedient to God the Father. Now, I want to make a distinction between humility and low self-esteem because I think often those are confused, especially in the media of our world where humility is not actually seen as much of a virtue. But humility and low self-esteem have a great difference in them. They're not the same any more than pride and confidence are the same thing. Low self-esteem is thinking less of yourself, whereas humility is just thinking about yourself less. Low self-esteem says you're not worth it, you're not good, you don't deserve anything, you're, you know, it, it beats us up, it breaks us down, whereas humility, humility recognizes who we are, what we're worth, that we're children of God, that he bought us at a great price, and that he loves us and created us, that we are his handcrafted creation. And yet, humility chooses not to use any of that to our own advantage, as Christ demonstrated. Humility chooses to lay all of that down to make it subjected and uh, submitted to the will of God the Father. Too often, low self-esteem comes in when we have a wounded pride. But true biblical humility comes when we have no pride, when we lay down our pride, and instead we pursue Jesus with everything we have, following after his footsteps as we see in this passage. Now, that's a great thing to aspire to, but obviously this is an incredibly high bar. This is uh, beyond what you may think we can attain. What an insane model to follow. Jesus' own humility is, is supernatural in its character, and yet we are called to follow after it. So how do we get there? Well, once again, as we go into this next section, Paul starts with a therefore. He says, because you are supposed to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, the humility that he demonstrated by dying for us on the cross, because he did die for us on the cross. Therefore, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What a powerful passage. But as you probably immediately picked up on, very easy to misinterpret. First of all, I want to be very clear. This says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, to work out our salvation, not to work for our salvation, not to work to earn our salvation. We already have the salvation. You can be saved just by calling on the name of Jesus. You do not have to work for it or earn it or deserve it. We have salvation. That is his gift to us. This passage is talking about because we have that salvation— We're supposed to work it out. And this term, work out, it really comes into English with two senses. The first, I think, would be better translated as walk out. If I were to say, oh, this is a person who walks out his beliefs, you understand what I mean. You understand that what I'm talking about is a person who behaves in line with what they say they believe. And here, we're being called to walk out our salvation, to behave in a way that is in line with an understanding of what Jesus did for us on that cross. 
But the second sense is actually pretty close to the English term work out. Work out as in go to the gym, as in exercise, lift, grow, train. We're being called to exercise our salvation, to work it out, to labor with it, to understand it, to allow it to change us. And then it says to do this with fear and trembling. Now, when it says fear, obviously it doesn't mean fear like being afraid of the dark or being scared or, you know, fearing spiders. It's a holy fear. This is talking about awe and reverence for God, the king above kings, the the creator of the universe. And when it talks about trembling, it's not talking about knees shaking or teeth chattering, but it's the trembling that comes with labor, with working out. After you've lifted weights in the gym or gone for a long run and your muscles are just trembling because of how much effort you've put in, that is showing that there's growth. The trembling is evidence that there was effort put in. But it's effort that was put into something so worthwhile, a good trembling, a trembling that speaks of positive change towards our goal. This image of working out our salvation with fear and trembling is not a picture of us being afraid or shaking. It is an image of a person on their knees wrestling with the the goodness of God, seeking to understand him, seeking to see his face, and seeking to become more like Jesus every day. The, all of that sounds very difficult, I know. And, and it's an image that often conjures up like, okay, well, that sounds like a lot of hard work. But Paul encourages us right after. He says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It's God who works in you. He's at work in you. You don't have to do this alone. In fact, you won't be doing this alone. If you're doing the work of understanding your salvation, of pursuing Jesus, of trying to become more like him, it is God who is working in you, the Holy Spirit, reviving you, changing you, reforming you into a new creation. And when it says to will and to act, God isn't just changing. He's changing the way we act, yes, the way we behave, but he's also changing the way we will, our desires, our minds. This goes back to, in our relationships, having the same mindset as Christ Jesus. You want to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. You have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, and God will begin to change your mind into that of Jesus. This is our duty as Christians. This is our calling, something that we are not just suggested to do, but something that is intrinsic to who we are as we pursue God. Now, if you're anything like me, you need this next section from Paul because he anticipates what could come from being asked to do hard work. He says, do everything, do all of this without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless And pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. I don't think I have to convince anybody that we're living in a warped and crooked generation. And hey, if the Bible's saying it, then probably this was also written during a warped and crooked generation. And I'll bet that all of human history represents warped and crooked generations. There isn't some magical time in our past, when all of humanity was holding hands in love and unity. We live in a sinful, fallen world. But we have been called to better than that. We have been called to be blameless and pure. And Paul is asking us to do this without grumbling, without complaining, without arguing. Now, maybe you're like me, and complaint comes pretty naturally to you. I'm the kind of person that will agree to do almost anything, but I'm going to complain. You want me to help you lift something heavy? I'm there for you, brother, but I will complain the whole time. You want me to take out the garbage? Done. I'll take out the garbage, but I'm going to complain the whole time. And I recognize that this is not my best trait, and it's not very endearing, and it's something that I need to work on. And Paul is calling us here. He's saying, like, look, you need to fix your attitude. Don't be grumbling. Don't be complaining. Yes, you're going to have to put in the work if you want to get closer to God, but it's worth uh, work worth doing. And if you're grumbling and complaining, that is a symptom that you do not have your mind set on Christ, that your attitude is not in the correct place or the correct direction. 
it is going to be hard work. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to pretend like seeking the face of the God of the universe and wrestling with the mysteries of our own creation is going to be a weekend course and then you're done. This is a lifelong struggle, a lifelong labor, but it's a labor that we can fall in love with doing. It's a labor that will bring joy and peace beyond measure and, and new waves of understanding of his grace and his mercy and his love. It's so worth our time. If Jesus didn't complain when going to that cross for us, then we shouldn't be complaining when he asks us to bear our cross. Now, this whole verse, this whole section, 1 to 18, that we read, it all works together in concert with itself. We read it in the forwards direction. We see that first we're called to have this unity. If we want to live a life worthy of the gospel, we need to be dwelling in unity. And then we see that we need humility, the the like-mindedness with Christ. And then we are called to work out our salvation. So although we read this forwards, we walk it out backwards. That as we begin to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, that will start to reform our mind to give us that humility of Christ to make us more like him. And the more we humble ourselves like him, the more easy it will be to live in community and unity naturally with one another. And pay attention when it says to work at our salvation with fear and trembling. It says, continue continue to work out your salvation. This isn't a one-time experience. This is something that we do on the daily, working out our salvation, behaving in a way that shows that we have been changed by the Holy Spirit, and doing the work to exercise, to lift, to grow in that area. So my homework for us all this week, what I would love for everyone here watching to do, is to do this, to work out your salvation in fear and trembling, spend some time with the Word of God, specifically sometime between now and next Sunday. I want you to read in your own time Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 18, which we've just read. I want you to read it for yourself. I want you to go through it and really seek to hear the voice of God in this passage Really seek to understand what's being said. Spend some time. Chew on it. It can be in the morning. It can be in the evening. It can be whenever you want. It can be any length of time. But sometime between now and next Sunday, I know you can find the time. Just read these 18 verses and spend some time thinking about them. And as you do, if you're getting insight, if thoughts are coming to your head or even questions coming to your mind as you read it, Write them down. Write them down somewhere. And I'd love for you to message me them. I would love to hear from you. I want to know what you're getting out of your time in this passage. It means so much to me, and I, I have great confidence that it will mean a lot to you as well. There's so much in here. And even if you don't want to message me, I encourage you, share with a brother or sister in Christ, someone else from our community Share with them what you got out of this passage. This does double duty because not only does it uh, encourage unity by sharing what we're getting from the Word of God, but if they haven't done their homework yet, it might push them to get on it. So let's go together. Let's do this. Let's work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Let's become more like Christ, and let's live in unity as a church. Let's pray. Father God, we cannot praise you or thank you enough for your goodness. Lord Jesus, your word to us is sweet. Lord, would you just allow your word to soothe our souls, to bring us peace, to bring us an immeasurable joy. Jesus, we want to work out our salvation with fear and trembling in awe of who you are. Lord, would you do your work in us. Holy Spirit, would you minister to us? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you're watching this today and you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, as I mentioned, he died on the cross for you. He has looked upon you with eyes of love. He sees your worth and your value, and he desires to have relationship with you, and all you have to do is say yes to him. 
If you would like to invite Jesus to be your Savior today, you can just pray along with me. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. I thank you for dying for my sins. I repent of everywhere that I was living, not in accordance with who you are and what you desire for me. And I call you the Lord and Savior of my life. In your holy name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, please tell uh, another Christian, tell someone who you trust. You can also message me, call our church office. We'd love to get a Bible in your hands if you don't already have one. So make sure to get yourself resourced that way. This is the most important decision that you could ever make. So now we come to communion, to the celebration and the acknowledgement of what we read and possibly the decision that you just made. When we read today about Jesus emptying himself, even though he was fully God, he took on the nature of a servant. He emptied himself. He laid down his life and was obedient even to death. Communion is the remembrance of that fact. It is the acknowledgement of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, that he loves us so much that he laid down everything so that we could be saved. And it is also the remembrance of his resurrection, that death was not the end of his story, and so death won't be the end of ours. That through the work of Jesus Christ, we also can be made alive with him forever. So whatever elements you've collected for communion, we're going to spend some time. We're going to take communion together now. And this truly is part of what it means to work out our salvation, that we would spend time with his Holy Spirit, remembering what he did for us. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, the new agreement between God and man, which is poured out, it is offered for you. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember his death until he comes again. So let's do that now together with whatever elements you have, whether it's in a group or alone. Let's remember the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for the sacrifice that you made. That we can have your great comforter, your Holy Spirit with us at all times. That we know that you loved us even to the point of death. Lord Jesus, would you help us to remember that, not just today, not just when we take communion, but all the time. That we would keep our minds set on you. And that as we do that, you would continue the work, the ministry of reforming us and making us more like you. We submit ourselves, our entire lives, to your guiding hand. Lord, we trust that your, your infinite goodness has better things in store for us than we could plan for ourselves. So, Lord, we just ask you to guide us and lead us and reform us and recreate us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. Uh, I, as I mentioned in the sermon, I'd love to hear from you. Even if it's just your random thoughts uh, on what you're reading in your devotions, or it's your thoughts on Philippians 2, or it's your thoughts on one of my sermons, I just want to hear from people. I honestly do. So please send me a message, or you can contact the church office. Hey, we could even go for a walk sometime. But go, be blessed, and have a great rest of your week.